Hello Mixtresses and Mixters. This is Mixtress Ray and you're watching Mixtress Video. Well, well, look who's on the floor again. I'm having a particularly difficult PMDD day, so I'm... And if you've never heard of that, it's basically PMS Extreme. Um, that's how I explain it. I'm just like having a hard time just like functioning at all today. So I decided it might be a good time to hang out and do another one of these deep dives. So today, my incense is not going into the holder. Oh, nothing is working today. Wine, wine, wine. Okay, there we go. Okay. So today we're going to do a deep dive of the Goth Mancy Tarot Deck by Stephanie Alia and Daniela Efe is the artist. This is a gothic pop culture tarot deck. My plan, of course you can see in the title if my plan has changed by the time you see this, but my plan is to only go through the major arcana of this deck. Um, not that there isn't a lot to see in the minor arcana because there is. Like I'll just do like a really quick kind of like flip through of some of the cards in the minor arcana just right now before we get started. I didn't put these in order. This is Brian Eno on the Ace of Swords. Every single card in this deck has um, not only like pop culture elements associated with each card, but also a song. Um, and I'm going to link, I made, um, or I put together the playlist, like the playlist was created by the um, authors of the deck. They created the association of each card with a song. Um, and I just made the playlist on Spotify so that people could listen to all the songs associated with this deck. This one's Temple of Love is the song inspiration for this one. This is a minor arcana. I'm just I'm just showing it to you really quick because basically in the guidebook, what did I just do with the guidebook? I set it aside somewhere. Basically in the guidebook, the first 78 pages are talking about the major arcana and then there's just like a little paragraph for each card in the minor arcana. So that's why I'm thinking with the deep dive um, it it would be a good idea to just focus on the major arcana with the deep dive of this deck. Of course we have Elvira here with the nine of pentacles. This is a super usable, the most usable pop culture deck that I've ever seen actually. It's um, based in Rider Waite Smith. It has a lot of symbolism in the imagery. Um, I think it's pretty thoughtful. I think the artist and author are planning to do this is the craft. I love that. Are planning to do a second edition of this deck, a Kickstarter for it pretty soon. And I think they said they were going to change some of the imagery. So being that this is after the great culling of 2021, which I'm still kind of in the process of, just last night I put Mystic Mondays in my purgatory drawer, I'm still sort of in the process of culling, but since this deck has survived the culling, um, I will entertain the thought of backing, even though I'm, I like to avoid Kickstarters as much as possible, I might back the second edition of this deck because the cardstock is not very great and they're planning to go with a better printer for the second edition. And I do think some of the imagery might have been a little bit rushed. I mean, it's not, this is a very thoughtful deck. So it's, um, but all of the artwork wasn't finished when I first backed the Kickstarter for this. 
I guess I'm just gonna flip through all of them. They're obviously in no particular order. This is Divine, which was the inspiration for Ursula on The Little Mermaid. Craft work. I think this is the Bauhaus guy. Don't quote me on that. I don't remember all of the associations. I don't know all of the associations, but I know a lot of them. This is Joy Division. The color schemes are really cohesive in this tarot deck. Bizarre Love Triangle is a song inspiration for this one. It's very usable, it's very thoughtful, um, and like I said, it survived the great culling so far. Like, I really have no plans to get rid of this deck. Good old Brandon Lee. Prodigy. I like this Knight of Swords with the tattoo. Anyway, so I'm just quickly showing you the Minor Arcana, and then we will do the deep dive on the Major. Every suit has a very cohesive color scheme, which is what I was starting to say. Like, the swords are all of these sort of, like, pastel shades of pink and teal. And the um, cups are this color scheme. There's a lot of Robert Smith in this deck which I am totally here for. Good old Gary Newman and the Ace of Cups. Drab Majesty and the Six of Swords. Okay. These are the backs. And just so you guys know, I have trimmed my deck. Um, I'm assuming that the new edition will have probably, will look more like this because the, the borders on the cards were a little obnoxiously big. These are slightly bigger than regular tarot card size, but not like obnoxiously big, but I did trim them down a little bit. Okay, so I've only done one other in this series so far, but the general plan, so I'm trying to get, it's distracting me that I have like should have moisturized my hands before I started this, but I didn't. Okay, so I'm going to just kind of, I'm going to read the first little parts of the guidebook with you guys. Gothmancy Divination and Darkness guidebook. And there's like, thanking the backers. Okay, let's read like this little introduction here. Gothmancy, Divination and Darkness, inspired by many great artists and my love of tarot, alchemy, and the goth, punk, and new romantic subculture. You will find numerous inspirations and Easter eggs throughout the deck. Okay, I'm not going to put the guidebook in front <laughs> the whole time. Easter eggs throughout the deck from music, film, literature, the occult, mythology, history, and more. I hope you enjoy finding them and that you enjoy this unique deck made for kindred spirits like you. The tarot is a tool for transformation if we allow it to be. Although the times change, the tarot's quintessence never does. Like our souls, it is prima materia, the original universal material. Okay guys, it is now like an hour later. I'm going to have to do something that I don't do very often, which is edit. <laughs> um, so I realized I, I got up to like the Empress the first time I was recording this and I realized that this book is too dense for me. Doing a deep dive for me is not going to be helpful if I read all of the guidebooks. So basically what I've done, I spent like about, I don't know, 30 minutes or so going through all the major arcana and sort of highlighting some of the main things. So I am going to read for you parts of, I basically, I tried to highlight, I'm going to read for you the song inspirations and the little paragraph 
in the guidebook that describes why the song was chosen or describes the song itself. I am going to read for you um, little bits of symbolism when it's when the guidebook is actually discussing the symbolism within the card. I'm going to read that part, but I'm going to skip over almost all of the alchemy stuff unless it's specifically referring to symbolism that is showing up in the card because for me personally, the information that is in the guidebook is kind of chaotic. It's not, it's just, it's basically a display of a lot of information and a lot of symbolism and a lot of um, alchemical stuff that was used as inspiration for the deck, but also used to explain the meanings of the cards the way that Stephanie Aaliyah sees them. So for me, it's too overstimulating, so I'm going to just take it down. So just so you know, as we go through this, um, th I am not going to be reading the whole guidebook like I was intending to do originally. I'm just going to try to focus on the visual symbolism and the song inspirations. And that's it. So here we go. The Fool. So basically what I'm skipping, just so you guys can see, I'm skipping over this little quote at the beginning. I'm probably almost always going to skip over most of the keywords. Um, and then the rest of it, I have just highlighted the parts that are kind of more symbolism related. And then the song inspiration, I will read for you guys as well. But I'm going to skip over most of like the alchemy and the occult sections unless they directly refer to symbolism in the cards, visual symbolism in the cards. Um, this is probably very useful for somebody that likes all of the information. For me, if there's a lot of information presented, I'm not going to be able to take it all in. So I have basically just simplified it for myself. <laughs> Sorry for the super long explanation for why I did this, but yeah, here we go. So, the fool, divine protection. The gothlings, white and Persephone. So those are the gothlings that you will see throughout the Major Arcana. Are ushered through a storm by a winged figure, the magician. The magician is also represented as um, Robert Smith. As they move past the storm, a rainbow breaks the gray clouds, signifying the magic and intervention of the magician. He feels a kinship towards them. Not long ago, he was in their place. Although they have experienced great trauma, he has saved their divine child. Which I think is an alchemical concept, divine child. So I guess at this point they've been through some kind of trauma already. I don't know. <laughs> the fool is gifted divine protection and related to the number zero and can travel freely throughout the deck. Traveling between the planes of dreaming, spirit, and the waking, a white raven appears. Only when people return to the teachings of the spiritual world will it do so. The raven, along with the magician, are witnesses to Persephone and White's spiritual journey. They, like the raven, are outliers. We do not know what the future holds, and yet we take our first steps Towards it. The song inspiration is Lullaby by The Cure. Lullaby's rich and surreal visual landscape returns us to the imaginative worlds of childhood, where the world often seemed threatening due to the newness of experience. The Spider-Man in the song is the familiar monster under our bed, but fear is also a teacher. When fear no longer rules our mental landscapes, our monsters have nothing left to feed on. They must leave, transform, or starve. As I'm reading that, I, I don't think I want to even read the entire description of the songs either, because for me, I'm just getting too confused with all this information, even after what I distilled it down to. I think I'm just realizing, as I am now almost three years into my like tarot journey, that like most of the time, I need a guidebook that's short and sweet. Does it really matter? I mean, if it is a super dense guidebook like this one is, I can always just do what I've done here and highlight the parts that don't confuse me and stick to those. 
Um, but yeah, I think as I go through this sort of deep dive journey, I'm probably going to discover more and more that guidebooks aren't always helpful to me. I like to know that there's a reason that the White Raven is here, but I almost feel like if I had just looked at this card and known all I would, really all I would need to know here is the magician is helping the fools, White and Persephone, and the raven is also here as a symbol of divine protection. And that's all I really needed out of all of that. So hopefully I'll be able to do that with this entire major arcana. Hopefully I'll be able to like actually distill for you guys the pertinent symbolism so that if you are like me, you can gain more of an understanding of this deck without being lost in all of the details. Okay, the magician. The magician has his four symbols. He's got the lilies and roses. He is represented by Robert Smith. The magician is surrounded by roses, creation of beauty, and above his head is the Ouroboros, a symbol of immortality and infinite cycles. Upon his shoulder is the white raven, so the white raven gets carried over from the fool. So that's important for me to know. Nature is an observer and animal. Upon his shoulder is the white raven. Nature as an observer and animal consciousness. I like that. If we are willing to put in the time and effort, we are rewarded by giving form to the intangible. Music has this quality. It lifts us above our human struggle, transporting us to previously unimaginable worlds. It heals and empowers us, a reminder of our greater purpose and what makes us human. The song Inspiration is A Forest by The Cure. A, the forest starts with a dreamlike, nightmarish atmosphere. Robert runs into this forest to search for a girl, becoming lost in its depths. He realizes the girl was never there. When our mind plays tricks on us, this is the magician's trickster quality. For me, I associate the forest with the moon card. So for me, the song association doesn't work, but I am totally happy with knowing, with seeing Robert Smith as the magician in this deck. I love the fact that we see Robert Smith represented several times throughout the deck because my favorite band is The Cure. It's one of the reasons why I connect to this deck. Honestly, I like I said before, I don't really connect to the alchemical aspects of this deck because that kind of stuff is just a little too... too prescriptive to me like I don't really like spiritualities that are kind of like this is this and all of the capital letters and blah 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 and like that doesn't work for me personally um, but the symbolism within this deck I feel like it's there but you don't have to engage with all of it you know that's kind of how symbolism is everywhere you can engage with whatever aspects of symbolism work for you and it's there for you if you want to go deeper. So maybe later in life I'll suddenly get super into alchemy and this guidebook will be here for me to teach me a lot about alchemy. And this deck will be here for me to teach me a lot about alchemy. But for now, I'm kind of ignoring those parts. High Priestess. The song inspiration is Rapture by Blondie. The Oracle. Standing in an ancient Egyptian temple, the high priestess and mortal disciple of Isis guards the secret of the elixir of the widow. We see the sphinx, a tetramorph, whatever that means, acting as a guardian. Vampire mythos and lore represent the secrets of immortality and can be applied to alchemy and its stages, as well as being a metaphor for transformation. Blood is life. Our own bodies create... So we've got... Basically, what we're seeing here is Debbie Harry as a vampire. And it also, like, part of the symbolism talks about, like, the cycles of menstruation a little bit. So my takeaway here is that we have Isis on the pillars. It doesn't really look like Debbie Harry. But I like the idea of like, you know, that's sort of an ancient, not ancient, but that's sort of an old 
witchcraft association, right? Um, the, the high priestess in a coven would be considered an initiate of Isis, right? So, um, that's an interesting, like, old school witchcraft association, I'd say. The Empress. Song Association is Cloud Busting by Kate Bush. And I do want to read, Kate Bush, in a manner, is, in a manner, an alchemist. She adapted her music into movement and dance. By integrating art forms, she created a cohesive, unique body of work. Usually, we focus on one craft, but Bush studied and combined her skills. She made her debut, Wuthering Heights, at 18. She was the first number one female performer in the UK who wrote her own lyrics. She didn't stop there. Prolific, original, and embracing freedom of expression without limitation, Bush has never shied away from what was different. So I think this is my favorite Empress card of all time. Upon her throne, the prolific Empress sits. Life explodes and flourishes in her presence, free and without restriction. Flowers blossom, trees bear fruit, harvests are bountiful. The Empress's crown has 12 stars representing her connection to the planets and zodiac, cycles of the months and otherworldly realms. She holds the tree of life. Roses and dyes are laid at her feet. Her garb is decorated with stars and pomegranates. So these are, I guess these are the dyes. So just like, you know, art supplies, essentially. <laughs> Um, the heart in the image represents Venus and Ceres. I just want to, like, a little gripe. The reversed meaning of this card, you know, says stuff about too much pleasure, in indolence, smothering, creative blockages. Fine, whatever. But then it also at the end says the mother in its opposite aspect, Kali, the destroyer. I do not see Kali as a reversed empress. I see her as an upright empress. Yes, she can be a destroyer, but she destroys for good reasons. Okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> I had to react to that because I did, wasn't even looking at the reversals and I saw Kali and I was like, ooh. Oh, Emperor is song inspiration is Johnny Cash's cover of Nine Inch Nails is Hurt. The Emperor sits upon his throne. Aries fire burns a fiery crown of thorns around his head. And that's all that I really wanted to say about what was in the guidebook. I didn't really like the other aspects of this. Sorry to Stephanie, Ilya, if you're watching this. I mean, obviously, like, tarot is, it's a system, but it's also, like, very subjective, right? And I have a great relationship with this tarot deck that you created, if you're watching Stephanie and Daniela, but um, your particular associations don't always work for me, that's all. The Hierophant song inspiration is Nomi Song by Klaus Nomi. Temple of Knowledge, Akasha. In this card, our gothlings are several years older. We see them as initiates. So here's White and here's Persephone. Between them are the master keys. Nomi's right hand is raised in blessing, two fingers pointed to the heavens. The Hierophant is the bridge between the divine and human. Upon his head sits a three-tiered crown of sound waves representing mind, body, and spirit in the transcendent experience of music. We can see that he is not in a temple, but that the cosmos is the temple. I like that. Susie and the Banshees, depicted on the Lover's card. I didn't, I didn't highlight anything 
in the in this card um, it is I do like when you just look at the card what you're seeing is the sort of dichotomies of the Sun and the moon the balance of light and dark Sun and moon you know like Phoenix and Swan all of these the imagery in the card really speaks to the lovers but the description in the guidebook doesn't really reflect it in a way that makes sense to me personally so that's why I'm not reading from the guidebook so the song inspiration is The Last Beat of My Heart by Susie and the Banshees The Chariot song inspiration is Get Out of Control by Daniel Ash. In this song, getting out of control actually allows the person to progress. Sometimes we may be too in control. The charioteer holds onto the reins and is being led by two tetramorph sphinxes. Sphinxes? <laughs> sphinxes. Sphinxes were often placed outside temples and tombs and acted as guardians and vehicles of the divine. In this card, the mycelium branch above the charioteer's head. I guess it's this. Like, sort of triangle of, like, veiny looking shit. Symbolizes the connection between nature and all life on Earth. riding a motorcycle and we still have like the little moons and he's got four arms I don't think I've ever like looked this closely at this card before to notice that he has four arms that's how overstimulated I get guys <sighs> didn't even ever notice that that charioteer has four arms Strength. The guidebook has a mistake. The strength is in here as 11 in the guidebook. Lydia grabs the Komainu lion by its mouth and exerts her will. References to the green lion in alchemy can be found in the Rosarium Philosophorum. It represents vitriol and how vitriol purifies matter by devouring it so that only gold remains. The green lion devours the sun. Song inspiration is Touch My Evil by Lydia Lunch and After the Flesh by My Life with a Kill, Thrill Kill Cult, which is on the um, Crow soundtrack, The Thrill Kill Cult. So we've got the Ouroboros, we've got Love, A Sun and Moon, The Green Lion, Lydia Lunch. It is a really beautiful strength card. I like the heart because I do sort of see strength as being um, overcoming fear with love in general. The Harmit. This is Edgar Allan Poe. Thing is weird. What's happening? There he is. Okay. The hermit illuminates the darkness with his lantern. His winged familiar gives him access to the spirit realm as he searches for what others might fear. A pioneer of exploration of the dark side of the psyche, he has a loving relationship with shadow. In the pale, foggy moonlight, we see a white, mountainous landscape. The lantern symbolizes Poe's exploration into the mysterious realms of the psyche. Song inspiration is Lonely by Tom Waits. Tom Waits is a Virgo, and in listening to his music, we get a sense of loneliness where one can feel like the hermit. We can be surrounded by people and still feel alone. We crave authentic connection if we are lucky to find it and lose it. It is not easily forgotten. And we've got, like, under the earth, a heart. So that's kind of like telltale heart, right? 
the tail tail heart and then the black cat and then isn't there a like golden beetle or scarab or something so i think that these three figures down here are just representing different stories by edgar Allan poe okay so that's all i highlighted in that card the wheel of fortune The letters within the wheel in the Rider Waite deck are an anagram spelling various words. Rota, Leo, Taro, Orat, to speak, Torah, the law, and Ator, the Egyptian goddess of love, the sky, fertility, and women. It also symbolizes the four elements connecting to the four suits. A cherubim holds onto a throne of angelic lore. Originally, Cherubim were fearsome angels made in the likeness of man, eagle, bull, and lion, guardians of Eden, and specifically the tree of life. The thrones represent divine justice, cosmic law, and harmony. The two together represent guarding of all life and cycling through the powers of circular motion and vibration. In our deck, we took the idea of the tetramorph and literal throne of God, absolute power that is generated by circular motions and cycles. We can see repeated themes of cyclical forces and motions and tropical forces constantly reflected within our solar system and throughout the universe. They're universal laws. These are also expressed in mandalas and the, Dharma, and the Dharma wheel. If we understand these cyclic, cyclic functions, we unlock universal truths that allow us to progress and use these forces in our favor. Song Inspiration Inamorada by London After Midnight. So basically what we're seeing here is the, the four figures symbolizing the four elements that we see in traditional Wheel of Fortune cards. We see like this sort of circular motion and these interlocking circles are kind of making moon phases. And we still have sort of the alchemical, or the, whatever that was, <laughs> the tarot, Torah, orat, whatever, all that crap. We got all that crap in there. As well. Cycles. Justice. Okay, now I have to find justice again because it's in the wrong spot in the book. Okay, here we go. Wearing her raven battle helmet, the triad of the goddess Morrigan sits upon her throne in judgment. Dressed as the war crow, sitting beside her is her loyal companion, the wolf, which represents instincts, reminding us that instinct sniffs out the difference between right and wrong. Song inspiration is Bodicea by Inya. Bodicea, one of many variations of the name of a Celtic queen from the Iceni tribe. She avenged the rape of her daughters by Roman soldiers and led a famous uprising against the Roman Empire. Inya's song is a beautiful and sad tribute to this brave warrior queen who dared to defy a greater power to restore justice and freedom to her people. Bodicea means victory. pretty good justice card I say and sort of like seeing her as the triple goddess um, I'm not I, I this is not necessarily what's intended here but for me what I'm going to remember what the distilled symbolism through my brain is going to remind me this is the goddess Morrigan and she is a triple goddess represented here through the crow the wolf and the person I know that's not literally what the guidebook is telling you, but that's how I'm going to personally see it. Hanged Man. Song inspiration is, I think, Downward Spiral, right? Yes, The Downward Spiral by Nine Inch Nails. This album shaped my teenage years. The album itself has its own film-like progression that evolves evokes endless stories. With eyes closed, whole worlds would be born and die as I lay on my bed listening to this album. I was suspended in time. When it was done, I would emerge, having lived what felt like lifetimes in my head. This is what the hanged man means to me. 
going within in order to transform, being still and letting our inner world communicate to us without external distraction while we put the outside world on pause. That's really it. I did not highlight anything else in the description of this card. I really like that sort of like personal reflection on the downward spiral, the album. Um, and it's actually, I didn't notice this at first, it's an album inspiration on this card. Not a song, but a whole album. I think this is a really great choice, actually. Here we have, I believe this is supposed to be, um, I just forgot her name. Oh my God. The chick that inspired death in the Sandman comics. What is her name? Cinnamon Hadley. Oh my God. I can't believe I almost forgot that. And I asked the, I asked Stephanie once if this was supposed to be her. And she said, yes, alongside some other inspirations. Um, the song inspiration is Resurrection by Christian Death. So I don't know if she was just being nice by saying yes, but to me, this is Cinnamon Hadley. <laughs> okay. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. The destroying angel mushroom reminds us that death is natural and we are impermanent. So that's what we've got going on down here is the, what's it called? Destroying angel mush mushroom. The black sun has been compared. So I, I think that's what this is back here is the black sun has been compared to the womb of the goddess and connected to Kali and the black bodhisattva. Terra. It is the idea that light comes from darkness. Despite its intense meaning and having been abused as a symbol, the black sun ultimately stands for the light that pierces the darkness. Only through chaos can new life be birthed. I like that. Um, for the song Inspiration Resurrection by Christian Death, this song makes me think of vampires who, after a long lifetime of seeing all things around them change, save for themselves, eventually become world-weary and welcome mortality in order to seek a peaceful place for their eternal rest. Who wants to live forever? Maybe just for a few centuries. Temperance. So we have, like, um white and Persephone kind of being represented here. Again, the duality of the sun and moon, that symbolism is carried throughout the deck. We have rain and lightning. We have the rainbow going between the two cups. We also have a raven. The song inspiration is Passive Aggressive by Placebo. Persephone takes on the qualities of the emperor and white those of the empress. The balancing of opposites represented by the divine androgyne. In our temperance card, we combine the cauldron and the crucible. Cauldron and crucible. I don't know what a crucible even is, <laughs> but I'm guessing like this cup is supposed to be a combination of a cauldron and a crucible. In Celtic lore, cauldrons were considered to have magical powers. The witch's cauldron represents rebirth, the womb, and abundance, and was used by alchemists in their pursuit of the great work. But really, like, just looking at this card, what you're seeing is the marriage of opposites. You're seeing the balance of, you know, sun and moon, white and Persephone, are two fools. You're seeing alchemy rep represented, which temperance is where you're supposed to see alchemy represented the most in the tarot, right? This card, I, it's got to be a mistake, so hopefully they're going to fix it with the second edition of the deck, because if you look, the devil card has this thick white border and none of the other cards do. 
and I don't think that's on purpose. Like the entire rest of the deck has these thinner white borders, but this one has a thick one. So hopefully they'll fix that with the second edition because it just stands out to me. I didn't highlight anything in the Devil card. The song inspiration is Master and Servant by Depeche Mode. Um, I'll, get, I'll read the like explanation for why she chose the song at least. I like the idea of her own personal bondage as being fun and light like play. Life is already serious enough to where we can twist reality in our favor instead of having it work against us. In life, we will play many roles with domination at the helm. There are lessons. They are lessons of control and sometimes the need to let go of so much control. So we're seeing here Dave Gahan as the devil, which totally makes sense to me. And I, I don't know if this is supposed to be Persephone in white. Let me go back through the description. There says something about Adam and Eve. This doesn't really look like Persephone in white, right? No, it's not, because Persephone is paler and white has lavender hair. So no, but that would have made more sense, I think, just personally, that's what I think. God, I'm so critical today. It's really just because of the extreme PMS that I'm going through at the moment. <laughs> Maybe this is a bad day to do this, but I'm enjoying my aesthetic and I'm enjoying hanging out with you guys, so I hope that you will forgive me if I'm just being like a little too harsh about this deck, because ultimately I love this deck. It's one of 20 decks I have left. So, the tower. Persephone and White lived in a metaphorical tower before the magician intervened. They see that the collective is likewise imprisoned. So this is kind of like a matrix um, interpretation of the tower, which I enjoy. This is actually one of my very favorite tower cards. Persephone takes the master key given to her by the Hierophant. So I guess this is, is this her? Is she the hands? Persephone takes the master key given to her by the Hierophant and unlocks the cage, imprisoning the collective mind. We are all cast from the tower by a lightning strike. In mythos, a sign of divine intervention. Chaos ensues as people become aware of the nightmarish reality they were living in. We are now free, but also exposed. Song inspiration is Change by Tears for Fears. It is never too late to acknowledge that change is necessary. Collective change is the ultimate goal. How can we work together to embrace tower-like moments and events that shock us out of our own self-made prisons? How can we rebuild as a collective and understand that, as one, we become a nearly impenetrable force? But through division, we are weakened. It's time to destroy the towers that divide us in order to reconnect with each other and a dying planet that needs our care and attention. It is time to wake up. I know I'm very much alone in this, but I don't like David Bowie. <laughs> he creeps me out. I don't know. Anyway, but this particular depiction of David Bowie is not, is not, I can handle it. I can handle it. I like the star card, despite the fact that I know it's supposed to be David Bowie. The song inspiration is Ziggy Stardust, cover by Bauhaus, and Space Oddity by David Bowie. White and Persephone are bruised and wary after the destruction of the tower. Oh, I thought based on that description that they were going to be in the card, but they're not. It's just describing their reality at this moment in the Major Arcana. Looking around, they see the world is not what it was. Walking around in a dreamlike re realm, they see a beautiful androgyne meditatively pouring water from an urn into what looks like the beginning of a great ocean. Upon the figure of the star's giant body are two tattoos, the Tree of Life and the Tree of Knowledge. So Tree of Life is here, Tree of Knowledge is here, and then we still have the, I think it's an egress bird that is normally in the star card. 
and that's all I wrote down for that. I mean, it's a pretty traditional looking star card, but it has, I, I love like this whole galaxy situation happening back here. I love the fact that like, he's got like a space helmet on, but he's naked. <laughs> like, I don't know. Are you really protected? I don't know, but I like it. I like his little star cape. The whole thing. Yeah, I like it. Despite the fact that it's supposed to be David Bowie and David Bowie personally bothers me. Here we have Robert Smith again. The moon, a wolf, wild nature, and a dog, domestic and loyal, are on either side of the water. So, like we normally see in the moon card, we see these kind of like Escher-like stairways and paths like we saw in the Fool card here. They're just sort of in the background here. I don't know if you can tell. The dogs will not let us pass until we confront our fears. As we step upon the shore, we can see the beautiful spires of our eternal goth city <laughs> beckoning us forth. That's in caps, all the, by the way. Eternal goth city. <laughs> moon takes on the face. The moon takes on the face of the magician, letting us know we are never truly alone. We always had our guides to lead us back home. The song inspiration is Moon Age Deidre Daydream by David Bowie. The sun is Tori Amos. <laughs> kind of like, I used to really, really be obsessed with Tori Amos. I've seen her in concert ten times. I've met her three times. I, she was my god for a while, seriously. So again, we see Persephone in white. Here they are showing up as children again with like dragonfly wings or fairy wings. And Tori Amos is the sun. Persephone and white have passed the trials of the moon. The, the divine child that rests within the two is reborn and made anew. The sun watches as they play in a secret garden. So, bleh, song Inspiration Silent All These Years by Tori Amos. Although it may seem that we have lost these aspects of ourselves, they can always be reclaimed. Listen to their silenced voices and encourage them to speak again. So I like the idea of, and that's definitely something that I didn't know before I read the guidebook, is Persephone and White are two fool characters that we follow throughout the Major Arcana being reborn as children in the sun card. I like the idea of like the child that you see in the sun card is actually just a rebirth of the fool that you see at the beginning. I think that might even change the way that I see, because normally I don't really like seeing a child in a sun card, but from now on if I do see that, I'm going to think of it this way. And I kind of like that. Judgment. This card has a lot happening. This card it makes me anxious looking at it because of everything that's happening here. So we have like some figures being sort of like carried away by butterflies and some are being chained to the earth. So this is really a judgment day situation, right? Song inspiration for judgment is Protest by Skinny Puppy. We can become dead to what is going on in the world, and we can create prisons for ourselves that render us immobile. This is us going with the flow in a way that is not conducive to growth or change. Sometimes we need a blaring trumpet to snap us out of this zombie-like state. It's time to wake up, dust yourself off, and greet the new world. And here is the new world. <laughs> Song inspiration for the world is Love Like Blood by Killing Joke. 
Released in 1985 by the English band Killing Joke, this is a song about approaching the things we love like a soldier in battle. We are willing to fight for what we believe in. Coleman said, the song was a distillation of everything we hold dear. One must aspire to walk and talk to walk and talk that you write about in your songs. Actually live it. Okay, I think that might be... Um, one must aspire to walk and talk what you write about in your songs. Okay. <laughs> Actually live it. Okay. I think I just misread it at first. Okay, you guys, this is not the best day for me to do this, but I already fucking did it, and y'all know I'm a process queen, so I'm going to put it out there anyway. I'm ratchet. Okay. The last task is at hand. Persephone and White now focus their quintessence upon the world egg. They are birthing a doorway to the Eternal City, where art and imagination are now but one of many of the strange laws that govern. A doorway to where human consciousness leads to creation and where the imagination runs wild and free. We have officially gone through the looking glass, uninhibited, the cosmic egg, cracks, and the suits are born in the image of this strange new world. The suits are born in the image of this strange new world. But they don't really look different than the suits in The Magician. Whenever it said that, I was like, are, did they look different from the suits in The Magician card? But they really don't. They're the same images. Okay, where was I? The Animus Mundi, soul of the world, forged from their prima materia, protects this new world and has been revitalized, allowing humanity to thwart another great cataclysm. This sounds like some rapture bullshit, doesn't it? In time, the process will repeat, but for now we enjoy this new era. We have reached the end of the cycle. Universal will and spirit triumphs. So, I mean... The good news for me is that I have no memory, so hopefully what I will take away from this process is what I want to take away from this process. Overall, the imagery in this deck supports my intuition. Like, again, any card in this deck that has a duality represented within it you know, has a sun and a moon. So we've got a sun on Persephone's face and a moon on White's face. They represent different parts of the duality. Like sometimes one of them is light and sometimes one of them is dark, vice versa. We see Robert Smith slash the magician as a thread throughout this, the entire major arcana. We see them as a thread throughout the major arcana. I can see that this is some alchemical urn of some kind or vessel and the world egg. There are symbols that I recognize within the deck. But overall, I just think the information, I don't, maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe, I mean, obviously this is completely subjective, but for me, it's just too much information. Like, even me distilling the guidebook down to what I found to be, like, more about the visual symbolization, symbolization, symbols in the cards. Still, like, this video is over an hour long, I think. <laughs> I mean, I don't really know because I've got to edit it together. I don't really know how long it's going to be. But, anyway. For me personally, my conclusion... Because I think at the end of most of my deep dives, I'm going to have to make a conclusion based on, like, did the did a deep dive into the guidebook help or hinder my process and my experience with the deck? In this case, I think it kind of... It didn't... I mean, I wouldn't say it hindered it because I did learn more about the deck than I knew before the thread of, like, before I was just like, oh, that's cool, Robert Smith is in a lot of the cards, but really we're supposed to see, when we see Robert Smith, we're supposed to see the magician, and the magician is helping guide the fools through the deck. Um, 
So I learned that. <laughs> and I think that is helpful to me. But for me personally, I am putting this guidebook away. I mean, like, I will definitely refer to it again if I need to see what a particular song inspiration is. Um, and I have highlighted parts in the guidebook that I do really find value in. And it's definitely a thorough guidebook with a lot of information. But for me personally, I don't need to go back to this guidebook for the most part. Because for me personally, it just confuses me. <laughs> and that is nothing to say against the creators of this deck. Because again, it's one of the only decks still standing. I love this deck. I will likely back the Kickstarter for the second edition. And maybe they will have redone some aspects of the guidebook to make it a little bit um, more just more simplified, hopefully. I don't know. Anyway, that's just my opinion on it. Like, don't let me sour anything on this deck because I do actually love it. So I'm going to shut up now because bitch doth protesteth too much. You know what I'm saying? I hope you guys are having a great day. Thank you for hanging out with me. It really, it's, it's, I love hanging out with you guys. <laughs> Seriously. Okay.